There are many apologetical arguments to demonstrate the proof for the existence of God. Do they have their place? Absolutely, there is no question about it. But will those types of apologetics ultimately persuade somebody that Jesus is Lord? There, I think they fall short. Does that mean we shouldn't use some forms of Christian apologetics to try to reason with people about the existence of God? We absolutely should, but we should know their limitations. Lots of people say there's no evidence for God. Well, we're going to knock that one out in three. I'm just going to have to keep it simple, throw in the old one-two combo, get in and out real quick, and let you find folks chat all about it, okay? Punch one I'm going to call the Info Uppercut. When's the last time you walked into a library and asked, hey, where are all the books that have been written by mindless products of natural laws? The librarian would probably laugh at you and tell you that no such books exist. And they don't exist because they can't exist. Why not? Because first of all, it's just common sense. The words that form the message in books always originate from a person with a brain. Or to say it a bit more scientific, Typically, the message of the book, the purpose, comes to be understood by the orderly placement of the words, design, and information. Ah, information. Now, anytime we find info, these basic laws always apply. Number one, matter doesn't spontaneously produce information. Uh, number two, only a mental source, intelligence, can generate new creative information. In other words, just like those books that couldn't originate without a mind, neither could life. Why not, you ask? Because we know that DNA contains information. Therefore, the laws of information science apply, which means the information in DNA couldn't have spontaneously generated and that a mind is behind the information. Period. No exceptions. Look at it this way. The simplest life form we know of is an amoeba, and it contains as much information in its DNA as a thousand complete sets of Encyclopedia Britannica. So, are we to believe that there's no way a message in a library book could spontaneously generate, but far more complicated messages in DNA that contain a thousand times more information could have? Not likely. You see, when it comes to life or anything else that contains information, the laws of information science confirm the necessity of a creative mind. And guess what? In the very first book of the Bible, it just happens to mention that. In the beginning, God created. Bam! Uppercut lands on the chin. And now here comes the indefensible head blow. We'll call this the not a big bang bing swing, the KO to the claim that there's no evidence of God, the law of causality left hook a doom. It goes like this. Everything that had a beginning had a cause. The universe had a beginning, therefore the universe had a cause. Now, either something caused the universe to come into existence or nothing caused it. Huh. I might not be the smartest guy behind the telescope, but honest, practical, everyday thing that's going to lead me to the latter. You have to work pretty hard to conjure up a way that nothing did it. You see, it's pretty improbable, nigh impossible, to account for design, information, and cause if the universe just exploded from nothing. Smack! And while we're on the topic, where did the matter come from that exploded? Are we really to believe that there was nothing and then it exploded, and now the exploded nothing is something, and we just happen to be smart enough to discover and understand the very laws that prove the opposite? And if the general understanding of the law of cause and effect is true, how can matter come from a lesser cause? like nothing. I mean, come on. I don't have a bunch of letters after my name, but even a monkey knows better. And yeah, I snuck in a couple of extra jabs in there, so sue me. Now for some parting words from our sponsor, the Bible. It tells us in Romans 1.20 that since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. It also says that people actually know the truth, but they reject it, which explains why even though there's overwhelming evidence that there is a God, evidence won't convince the unwilling. Sad but true. So there you have it. With just a couple of meaningful blows, the claim that there is no evidence for God God is down for the count, me amigos. In other words, it's been debunked. I'm exhausted, <laughs> Carl Kirby. Does he talk that fast during his conferences? Almost. You can learn more about debunked reasons for hope. Carl Kirby zooming through the arguments that do indeed prove the existence of God. He just slung a couple of at you lickety split. You've got yourself the teleological argument. If you have got yourself, for instance, a table that is organized and designed, you gotta, well, you see what you, you got a thing, a bottle with a decorative design wrapped around it. That keyword is design. When you see something that is organized, there's got to be an organizer. The universe, it is so complex, your eyeballs alone phenomenally complex, organized, great detail. All of the parts had to be there at the same time for them to operate and exist and have a reason to exist. Therefore, we can conclude there is an organizer. There is a designer. Furthermore, he threw the cosmological argument out that there's something. What? Did it come from nothing? If you got something, there's got to be a somebody or a some 
thing, otherwise you'd have nothing. That's the cosmological argument. There's another argument that he didn't use. I like it a lot. The transcendental argument for the existence of God. The moral argument that if we can agree that we have got universally accepted moral standards that points us toward a God. It points us toward something transcendent and something objective. If you've got morals at all, there has to be a moral lawgiver. Otherwise, all we have are preferences, and that's preposterous. I don't think, I'd like to think nobody has ever said, well, I prefer that Nazi Germany didn't happen, but who am I to judge? Actually, as an aside, boing, recently was witnessing to a young lady. She had herself a university textbook on ethics. I asked her what she was studying, and she was talking about studying about medical and scientific ethics. How do you make those decisions about life issues? How do you make those decisions about in vitro fertilization, et cetera? And I said, well, what's the standard? What's the basis for your morality? And she said, well, that's a really good question. And I said, would you agree with me that Nazi Germany was objectively horrible? And she said, well, I used to think that. <laughs> what, you used to think that? Now, she said, I've learned from professors that a lot of scientific experiments came out of Nazi Germany. <laughs> the Mengele experiments, do you know what they did to those people to get any sort of medicinal information that maybe has benefited us just a little bit? They tortured people, they brutalized people, they did wicked things I wouldn't even describe for you because it would be so awful just to hear it. And she uses the outcome of those experiments to justify Nazi Germany? What is that? That's pragmatism. That's utilitarianism. Hey, something good comes out of it, then it's okay. The ends justifies the means. Zoinks scoob. And that actually brings us back full circle. While these arguments have a place in the Christian apologetics quiver, they are arrows that are never going to hit the bullseye. All these arguments for the existence of God can do is actually let people know that there is a God. These arguments can lead somebody to theism, but they can't lead them to correct theology. In other words, they fall short in teaching people about Jesus. Welcome to a world without wretched. Nobody wants this. Please become a Wretched Gospel Partner.